so much of the games we're playing is we're trying to um, take people's attention, right? We're trying to take attention. And you mentioned there's noise. There's noise because everyone's trying to take attention, but no one's really trying to give attention. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. All right, welcome to the B2B EQ podcast. I'm Tim Harris, your host, and today's guest is someone whom I, who I'm excited to have as one of my first guests. He's a serial entrepreneur, marketing mastermind, an adventurer, an author of Marketing Automation Unleashed, and the host of two podcasts, Creating the Greatest Show and the Hard Corpse Marketing Show. Founder and podcast architect at Ringmaster Conversational Marketing, Casey Cheshire. Casey, great to have you on. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on here. And that was just, a, that was a killer intro. I really appreciate it. You've got a lot behind yourself. I mean, podcast architect, we're going to have to drill into that later on. <laughs> but not only that, I, I have an affinity as a fellow marketer, serial entrepreneur, someone who's led companies. I'm excited to hear your story. And uh, well, with that, let's let's jump in. I'm going to come right at you with uh, with our first question. In B2B sales, what is the one soft skill that really positively impacts relationships and drives revenue? It's, it's going to sound crazy and redundant or completely out of left field. It's listening. It's, it's, <laughs> it's actually listening and not kind of listening, but, but truly hearing the words that are coming out of the mouths of your prospects, of your customers. It was crazy is they actually give you they give you the answer, right? They, they tell you how they want to be either sold to or talked to or worked with. They're literally going to give you the, not only just the way to do it, but the actual words they use, the vocab they use is what we need to be using back to them. And, and you only hear that if you're, if you're truly listening when they're talking and not just um, biding time until you know your next prepared question. Going back into a conversation or having a sit down with a client is like arming yourself for your next marketing campaign. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of us in the marketing world put so much emphasis on creativity, right? Oh, I came up with this really cool subject line. I'm sure it's going to get lots of, lots of opens on that email or, or man, look at that ad read or that really clever thing that I put in that particular collateral somewhere on a wall. And, and sometimes, we make the art that we create, it, it can lose track of who we're actually trying to communicate with, right? And so what I'd love to do is de-emphasize uh, our own creativity and instead emphasize listening. It's not rocket science. We don't have to be Picasso. We just literally have to listen, ask a good question and just, hey, what what's keeping you up at night, right? What is? Tell me what your day job looks like. Tell me what you know, what are the problems you're encountering? Maybe don't even worry if they, they affect the SaaS I'm trying to sell you or if they, if they affect anything that I can do to help you. Just tell me what, what's challenging, right? And then just shutting up, listening, and they're going to tell you the words. They're going to tell you the phrases. To your point, instead of coming up with a bunch of these marketing phrases, in fact, marketing phrases is what gets us – to the delete box anyways, right? Cause you get too clever. I, I, we, I was reviewing an email recently and my feedback to the team was that looks like it was written by a really good marketer, right? But that was a problem yep. because it looked like it was written by a really good marketer. We want it to come from another human that's just trying to help you solve a problem. Well, I think you, you hit on a few things there and I'm, I'm going to take that cause there was some gold in what you just said. Number one, like, I loved how you went tactical right away. So take me back because I think in marketing, it's one thing, copywriting, the way we get too creative and, and confuse our audience, right? We laugh and we say, oh, in, in, the, in the sound chamber of, of our teams, this is hilarious. It's a play on words. And somebody <laughs> right. with two seconds goes, I, I didn't get it, 
right? Because they were so busy with everything else going on in their life. It's just lost in confusion. But I love how you got tactical about kind of going into and using the words of the customer. How have you seen that, not just in marketing, but in your sales engagements? How have you seen that be used effectively as well? You know, one time I grabbed coffee with with a client uh, and it was at a Starbucks just outside of Atlanta. And I remember my team there, their team there, and it was great, obviously building relationships and being able to buy someone a $16 cup of coffee or whatever it is now, but to be able to, you know, just share, share a drink. That was fine. You know, uh, but we sat down and they started talking and I tell you what, five minutes in, and I already had my brain full of ideas. I finally understood the problem that they were really facing, right? In their particular marketing and sales funnel, they had to convince doctors to take a certain action and they had to they had to train them and they had to convince them to want to be trained <laughs> and all this had to happen before they could sell their product or before that that doctor essentially would become like a reseller of their product and that i understood that if maybe i didn't understand that because before because on their site or maybe in conversations we talk about tech or we talk too much about our, the marketing goals we have, but to hear, okay, you've got to convince some really busy doctors to stop for a second and learn something new. They've already spent, you know, however many years, decades in school already, you have to convince it. So all this came about from just five minutes into a coffee. And it, and it just reminds me how it, it's not enough to just do a, you know, a trade show and, you know, and, and have beers. And it, sometimes th those are parties. You're not here. Well, let me tell you about what my customers' challenges are. Yeah, maybe, maybe not really the right time. But you need to find some time, carve out some time where you can ask some questions and just listen to the answers. And if you can, record them because yeah. what you're going to be hearing is gold. And all you really have to do is bundle it back up and give it back to everyone else. And they're going to start buying from you. Well, and take me back to that because you take carve out 30 minutes, 45 minutes with somebody who's a potential client, right? You run an agency. So you're looking for not only a sale here, you're the seller, but you're also the solutioner to some extent. Sure. So you're, you're wearing both hats. So just like in our B2B world, we, we've educated as a consumer, we've gone online, we've looked at all the review sites and I come to a seller and I'm kind of going, okay, you have a vested interest in buying. I, I trust you, but I'm looking for a trusted advisor that'll take me above and beyond what I've what I've read. And I think where you, where you're calling it out is like rather than trying to say, well, my solution will take you above and beyond where you read, or this is how you should solve the problem. Let me flip that. Let me listen to how your problem feels to you. This doctor, for example, hey, this is how I need to solution this. This is how I'm how what these are the barriers I'm seeing, and then you get to come up with the solution. So. Fast forward, what was that solution for that doctor? How did you kind of take what you understood there and move that into something that helped move their business forward? Yeah. So the, the first step was hearing how my client, what my client's problem was. So, mm -hmm. so we better understood the services we could provide. And then we repeated the exact same process for them where we said, you need to listen to these doctors. What yeah. are, what are their problems? Like, our two companies in isolate, we don't know. We're not doctors, right? Um, I played one on TV, but I'm not really a doctor, right? But yeah. so we had them, we had them sit down and, and interview their their biggest fans and also some of the people that chose not to do the training. Very and nice. and we got a little bit of their time, maybe a little bribery, a little coffee bribery there, but we were able to carve out some time and we'll get into how this can be hard to to get time with people and how there there yeah. actually is a solution for that. But we were able to carve out some time with them to just truly listen and, and hear that the doctors actually had time uh, after 6 p.m. They had some time. Uh, some of them were early risers doing that, you know, doing that Jocko Willink thing. They were up at 4.30. So they had time at 5.45 if you uh -huh. were around. And, and so we, we learned these little golden nuggets just by saying, hey, in an ideal world, if we were going to, you know, train you on this, like what would actually make you do that? You know, and then yeah. they started saying, well, look, if – you know, my practice needs X, Y, Z. My practice also needs to hit a certain amount of um, revenue and sales and engagement and add-on products. And they said, okay. So we're, they started messaging about add-on products and about how your, your, what your practice needs to grow and to, to be more stable. And, and so they started using the language 
that the doctors gave to them. And sometimes That's it awesome. wasn't good language, right? It doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, um, you know, Shakespearean grammar. No, it's no. imperfect language, but it was real language. And so to your point, they felt heard. They felt like, you know, you can say you're a trusted advisor, but you just literally said what I was thinking five minutes ago. Yeah. You must know what you're doing and you must be working with other people who have told you that the secret password of, of what our problems are. I, I like how you said that the secret password, because you do notice, I think on the sites or, or different marketing materials that I follow, or when I talk to a salesperson and they, they know my industry, they understand the jargon I'm using. You feel like you're talking to almost a, a coworker, not somebody that's necessarily trying to sell you something like you're sitting there solutioning together. I was um, recently at a dinner and, and, at the dinner, the, the speaker, great CEO, but he shared, it was like sales is going to move from a transactional relationship to a combined solutioning effort because all this stuff's getting so complex. Yeah. And so it, it does align to like what you're seeing where listening is that, that critical skill. Yeah. It's funny because that really does change, you know, what, what sales's job is, what marketing's job is. And, but imagine if we all just had listening in our job description, how much time yeah. we would save, how much more efficient we would be. Well, and, and then it's okay. How do we get through the amount of noise? So you, you teed this up perfectly. You're in the marketing realm. Um, focused attention is, is totally difficult to earn these days. I think there's more noise than ever in the market. How important is it for your company to stand out? Yeah. And, no, noise, attention, and like, how do you even get the five minutes with someone to yeah. to even ask them that? Let alone sell them something, right? People don't want to get on calls. I I've started to feel like you know we did the time in the agency, a lot of work doing B two B marketing and and even sales now too, and you start seeing there's some games that are being played, and I just I just I can't play the game anymore. The game of like notice me, notice me, and then I want to get on the phone with you, even though you don't want to get on the phone with me. So let me think of what kind of tricks I can do to get you on there, right? How can I steal your attention, steal your time and attention that you don't want to give me, but but this is it's almost like we're we're punching jello, right? It's like we're all playing this game and we're spending lots of money and time doing it in and, and our prospects don't want it and we don't really see much success from it either, but it's like what we're doing. And so it, it was wasn't until I discovered podcasting where I really sort of flipped the script and it was accidental. It was totally accidental. I wanted to launch a podcast just to get good content. Yeah. But I started asking people who I had no business asking to be on the show, famous thought leaders, and eventually my target audience, right? My target audience and eventually my ideal customer profile who were like dreaming big, like the top yeah. 100 companies that I had probably no business talking to and they wouldn't even look at me, but I, I wanted to talk to them. And they all started saying yes to being on a podcast. So one of the, the changes I made was instead of trying to get that moment of time like we did with the doctor's office, it was really hard, right? And oh, I don't have time. They, and they also think you're going to surprise them with a pitch as well. Like you're going <laughs> to pull some eyeglasses out of your briefcase and try to well, sell them on. something. Right? It, it's the timeshare. It's the timeshare pitch. Oh my we gosh. All know Once you get a timeshare, you can't get rid of it, right? Don't buy timeshares, people. <laughs> um, time. So yeah. And so one of the things that happened is people started saying yes. And then I realized it, it was different. So much of the games we're playing is we're trying to um, – take people's attention, right? We're trying to take attention. And you mentioned there's noise. There's noise because everyone's trying to take attention, but no one's really trying to give attention. And so when you do a podcast interview, you're actually giving someone else your undivided attention. You want theirs, right? But instead of demanding their undivided attention, because think about those sales calls, right? We're on these things and, and this is why we need tools to even help us, but we're on these things and and people are staring at us. Are they staring at us? Are they checking their email? Are they zoning out? We need to pick up on these cues. There's all sorts of things going on. And are they really into that call? Well, on a podcast, they have to be, right? I can't yeah. check my email right now because if I do, <laughs> that'll be the one moment that you ask me a really good question and I just, I look like an idiot, right? So, and, and so I'm focused. I am with you 100% in this conversation. There is nothing else going on, right? And so when you have your ideal customer doing that with you, and you can ask them questions and they'll be happy to answer them. That for me was the final 
you know, that final uh, tipping point that got me to the point where I can now talk to as many customers and prospects as I want. They're happy to give me their time and attention because I started by giving them my time and attention. I, I think that's a golden rule. I mean, we learned that give, give, give. I think we've, we've read the books on it a, a thousand times. We know the act of giving. We do all the gifting and all that stuff, but just giving our attention because yeah, I, I feel like where the market's gone is fascinating too. It's it's the it's the idea of I'm going to buy your attention. Hey, I'll give you a hundred dollar gift card to show you a demo of my product. That was done years ago, right? Our phone systems they figure out okay, it's five hundred dollars to get a new client. I'll just give you Casey the five hundred bucks and and come join me as a new client of X Y Z company, <laughs> right? Not knocking it. Hey, great growth opportunities there. But when you think of B2B and you think of these relationships, long-term growth relationships where, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna pair companies together and try and grow over time, right? The, these yeah. bigger deals. It's, it's gotta be around trust. It's gotta be around not the $100 gift card, but I feel heard, I feel understood. I know they're gonna work with me because you get on the $100 gift card call and it's like, let me grill you with a hundred questions. And I think the difference is, if I came on and didn't let you speak and didn't just listen, I'm not learning anything. Yeah. I, I think back to the, you know, the, the barn door swung to the point of, you know, account based marketing and, you know, I'm just going to send them socks from their alma mater. Right. <laughs> and then they'll be so happy that they'll take my call or, or I haven't now I've never benefited from the $500 thing. I will definitely take your call for $500. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can't promise you I won't be on my email though. You know, it's like, and so it's like, how do we get their time and attention? It's it's by giving it. Well, and, and it's just an arms race at that point. Like the $500 sounded good, but did the $5 Starbucks card <laughs> sound good to you, Casey? <laughs> right, right. So, so then we're all just going to move into that. I, I think it's 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 an interesting trend we've got our, our, our hand on right here. So how are you seeing successful companies interact as brands with customers? What are you seeing work in the market and build those stronger connections? You said podcasting. We'd love to hear some of the other thoughts you have. Yeah, it starts with podcasting, but what I've seen it turn into after podcasting is that that just sort of begins. It's like a, it powers the conversation. It's like a, it starts with a podcast, but where it, where it ends up after that is it becomes a community. So I'm, I'm seeing that the tip of it is podcasting and that's these one-to-one -one relationships. And then, then what comes next is the one-to-many relationships or the one-to-few really, where you have a community of these like-minded people who really benefit from hearing each other. I was just on a call the other day with a bunch of other um, CMOs and fractional CMOs. And we we're all talking about what it means to be running marketing for a team and, and talk through resources and ideas and, and it's a call that I try to make every time they have it for, with no yeah. fanfare, just because I want to interact and learn from some of the peers in my group. And, and that's magic. And so we've seen the podcast can start by creating a bunch of content that can fuel and really inspire and start some conversations inside of a community. But really, it's then about opening it up to everyone that's listening. All right. Mm -hmm. Interact with me and the guest and fellow people like yourselves in this community. So that's where you're starting to see like Slack communities or even Facebook groups and all these other places, like whatever's easy to get to, let's all meet there. And sometimes it's the boring questions. It's not, you know, it's not the thing that we're all thinking of. It's just, well, you know, how are you doing invoicing? Or, or it's like, how, how are you managing your team's time? Or just these little small things mm -hmm. that don't make the cut of like large scale marketing and sales campaigns. It's these little, little things. But if you're the one facilitating the community, then, then it's all thanks to you that you've been able to gather this information. But it's, it's the little rocks in all of our shoes every day, right? We, we walk down this path, whatever your role is, and it's those little rocks that over time really wear at you. But maybe you're right. You can't go get four or five people from your team to actually sit down and figure it out. So that's, that's a good place for community to sit. I, I got to validate the the Slack and, and some of those other channels for the sellers out there. It seems to me that the access to people, the ability to kind of share information and start a conversation there seems a lot stronger than email these days and some of the other traditional channels. 100% user groups, right? So, so no. community at a high level, 
And where I've seen this work really well is you don't try to have a community for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, back in the work on the marketing automation side, we had a community uh, for all the CMOs and senior marketing leaders, and they would all, uh, and we still do actually, and, and it's private though, it's invite only, mm -hmm. and it's all uh, based on the guests from the podcast who are fellow CMOs and VPs of marketing. Oh, wow. And in many cases, the ideal decision maker at the ideal customer profile, right? Like it's mm -hmm. all lined up there beautifully. But what about their team, right? We're selling it to enterprises. We're selling it to big organizations. This person may be the one making the decision or owning the budget, but maybe they're going to pass it to someone else. So we've seen um, running in parallel with this thought leadership group and this, you know, high level executive mastermind are these mm -hmm. smaller user groups and, and not even smaller. Actually, sometimes they become bigger. These, these wow. user groups that have the end user in them, right? All the end users. And so when we did uh, account based marketing campaigns, we would invite the senior leaders to the senior podcast and eventually the community. And we would invite the person rolling up their sleeves and getting it done on their team, we would invite them to the user group and the user group can be a little bit more open. So it's not necessarily invite only for the VPs and CMOs. It's for everyone touching this product, working with it, learning from it, and they're learning from each other. And what gets amazing is well, when and, and go ahead. you build that camaraderie, right? Like I'm yeah. just, I'm sensing this energy as you talk about it. Like I'm thinking, okay, as a user, I got to log into this software every day. I'm the one or two people on my own team or my own group that's using it. Now I'm part of a bigger group that's actually getting energy around, oh, how can I use this? What can I do? Totally. So keep going. Sorry, but that's no, exciting. Totally. We, we had people volunteering for different positions in the user group, right? So mm -hmm. you don't even have to run it. You're just facilitating it. You're feeding it content from the podcast. You're helping promote it. But guess what? We had people volunteer to be the promotions chair and the new member chair and welcome new members and promote. We had an education chair and we had a social chair where every Friday it was like tea and tech and the, and anyone that wanted to join could hop on a go. Zoom and have some tea together, talk a little tech. And that was cool. And everyone had their own take on it. But people started taking ownership of different pieces and parts of this user group around the product we supported. And it was magic. And again, it was there's no trick. There's no game here. But guess what? Our team's there too. And we're not only there and, and you know learning from them and experiencing maybe having some tea with them as well. But mm -hmm. as soon as three or four of them start complaining about X, Y, and Z not being a thing, or, you know, this bug is like a thorn in my side comes up on T and everyone goes, yeah, that sucks. And no one reported it. Right. <laughs> yep. If you're there to hear that, you're there to fix that. Or if they're yeah. saying, this is the, this is the feature that really I'd pay twice as much for. I got the product just for this one feature. Maybe nobody knows that, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> they, they didn't tell you that on the sales call, but they might tell you that in the community. And if you're hearing that, whether you're in sales or marketing, you can share that same thing you heard back to listening. Share what you heard in the community with yep. future prospects and future people to be a part of it. Well, it's where that real pipeline of conversation, that real feedback, not the stuff that's, okay, I sent out a survey and I'm asking for a snapshot in time, or I sent out an NPS score and only the person that's so frustrated because the system didn't work today or vice versa. Totally. And then we as, as, as leaders, as marketers, as sellers, we shape our presentations, we shape our campaigns around maybe the, the loud vocal minority, but we don't get that kind of heart of the conversation. I love that. I love totally. where you're going. Dude, I just did a survey like two days ago. And, uh -huh. and one of the things was around like why I made the decision and well, well, okay, what I got the most value from, I think was the question. And wouldn't you know, there was four or five answers, no other, and not a single one of them was the answer of why I made the decision, right? But uh -huh. I'm forced to pick one of those four. So somewhere, someone who has some bias of this is why people are buying this thing is getting all, is getting all sorts of data back. Maybe it's confusing. Maybe we're all just picking the first answer because for a lot of us, it's not that answer. Yeah. And and then you're, you're doing marketing again. You're doing mar you're, you're creative, you're clever marketing yeah. off on a tangent. It's the same kind of thing when you, when you see a lot of people really focusing on drop down boxes. Okay. Fill that drop down box with all the different things. Well, maybe you just need to leave it blank. Yeah. No, it's That's true. Good question. Well, and, and get a real pulse of the customer. Like get a real I, pulse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. So all of this is super exciting. 
I, I want to get into one question that, that I love hearing from my guests, which is you're, you're on the cutting edge of, of where I believe B2B marketing and B2B sales is going and, and where the engagement's going, right? We've talked offline about, you know, kind of armed with a million email spam cannons and the things we can do and how going back to listening, going back to these soft skills is, is the differentiator. Where do you see this going in the future? What excites you kind of about overall future, not just in, in your company, but, but in the overall market as well? hundred percent things keep changing. Right. And as much as I hate change, like literally physical change in my pocket, I hate <laughs> that is as much as like when things change, like, Oh, things are great now. Why are they changing? They, they keep changing. Right. It's the one constant is that things are changing. And as long as you're thinking about it and aware of it, and maybe listening to this podcast and staying in touch with it, I, the change that really comes to my mind is, is it, I spent 10 years working and getting really good at blasting personal, you know, care at scale, right? Very personalized mm -hmm. messages in a very automated way, very sequenced, all react, you know, automatically reacting to your actions. And the world is getting good at this. So the noise is not going away. The noise is going to get to the point where it's deafening, right? It's a, yeah. it's a game five Stanley cup, um, <laughs> completely full arena. And, you know, it's like, it's really loud. So yeah. that that's not it's not getting quieter it's getting louder and and so what I'm happy about is that that just forces the the point around listening that much more mm -hmm. everyone's shouting and when it, it, you've seen this in a room too everyone's shouting everyone's talking loudly it's that person who asked that quiet question usually it, even the it's usually the CEO like usually the the person in command of that room asks that quiet question and everyone shuts up and listens right and they're like well, what's going on here? And so I see this trend going toward listening more and more with podcasts, right? So where mm -hmm. does this go? If I put my like wizard hat on, I, I see this becoming a thing where your, your podcast is your business card. Your podcast is your calling card. Mm -hmm. And just as all these consumers and all these buyers, more and more of the sales and marketing process is happening before they talk to us, right? before even they're on our property, before we can even track them, more and higher percentages, Sirius and all these other folks will, you know, 70%, all these other percentages, more and more of the sale is happening out of our control in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the dark web, if you will. You can't track it, you can't trace it, it's happening. A lot of it's gonna happen through listening to these shows, right? You're gonna be creating communities long before people are even needing your product. Just like in the old days when HubSpot was teaching everyone marketing long before yeah. people even knew that they needed to buy a tool, before that tool even cool, before they even figured out what to call their tool, they were teaching everyone things. And so that, that community-based listening and that like podcast-based listening is going to be out there and people are going to be, are going to be consuming your content uh, long before. So by the time you actually chat with them, They've listened to your CEO or your evangelist for hours. They know them, they love them, and they trust them. And they trust you by proxy because you're in the same company and they've heard people in your company talking for a while now. And so that's gonna be the thing where, and there's an unfair advantage when you do that. When you, when you truly listen, it becomes completely unfair and it doesn't yeah. matter how loud you scream, you're not gonna win to the person who's quietly listening. I, I love that. And I think the, the thing I'm going to double down on is trust. Yeah. Listening comes and builds trust. Like over time, when you listen, when you understand who I am, where I'm at, and then you can help me because of that, the trust is there. There's a, there's a cool quote. Zig Ziglar says, if people like you, they'll listen to you. Yep. And if they trust you, they'll buy from you. Right. And I just, why, how are they going to like you? Well, they're going to like you actually, if you're listening to them, you're giving them that time and attention and, and not being selfish with it. Cool. You might start a little relationship, a little rapport here, but to your point, that trust, you know, it's interesting about trust. When I think about some of the ways that even a podcast builds trust, we do a little mm -hmm. prep call typically. And oftentimes we'll tell people, this is the question we're going to ask. And then you ask, then you actually ask it. And, yeah. and that is actually like a, a tiny little proof of trust in that relationship. And this, this, any, any phone call, any interaction with a customer, 
you, if you say you're going to do something and you actually do it, you just built a little nugget, a little Lego brick yeah. of trust, right? And it's that in that you build those things over time to the point where when it comes time to make a hundred thousand dollar decision, it didn't happen. It wasn't an overnight success. Those no. Lego bricks of trust have been built over months, over years. They've, they've listened, they've subscribed. Well, and it's, it's so true to, I think the way we buy, because if I'm one of eight people in a buying decision and my team is going to have to implement this, my team's going to have to use this, I'm going to have to champion this. There's got to be a lot of buy-in for a solution these days to now make it past the CFO, right? Because right. we've all, we've all looked at our budgets. We've all looked at what we're spending on these things, technology being the one that I'll talk to, but yeah, it's, it's a fascinating time on that side. So the trust is is critical. I love the idea of kind of that brick by brick building it and what a cool way to start the conversation. So Casey, I love where we've gone with this conversation. I want to get the audience an opportunity to learn a little bit more about you. So take me back to little Casey, who are you kind of where'd you come from and what brought you to this point in your career? Yeah. Little Casey, little Casey was putting on magic shows in the neighborhood <laughs> and, and just like sort of that, that mix of creativity and analytics that has developed into say marketing or, or revenue operations, that kind of thing. I, I sort of always had that. So after I do this sort of creative magic show, I remember tracking it in a binder. I had this binder where every time I did a show, I would fill out this sheet that said, okay, you know, I wonder if this is like a, a foreshadowing to like filling out a CRM or something, right? But I would <laughs> fill out a sheet that said, okay, I did a show. It was a birthday party. Did I have any expendable materials? Like I could make this ribbon come out of my mouth, you know, that be one time use. So you have to get another one. So I, I would keep track. Of, how did it go? What could I do better? What could I do worse? So I've always thought about my thinking. You know, I'd always sort of debrief myself. How did that go? What could I do better? And and what can I track here? And what can I keep track of? Not to a crazy extent, right? There weren't like endless notebooks of, of matrices and whatnot, but there was just a little bit of, of thinking about what could I do differently next time. And it was crazy is when you start collecting those things, the pages add up to when you look back in that notebook, you're like, oh, wow, I've done 15 shows. This is, this is wild. And you doesn't really, you don't really think about it that way. So that little kid was just constantly learning new things and trying new things and launching little businesses and, and little projects and, uh, and just over time discovered computers and enjoyed the internet finally. I mean, dates ourselves a little bit, but uh, I was around when the internet really got born. We'll, we'll call it AOL was when it really, I mean, I'm, that might- Map crackle pop yeah. as you connected and, and everything right, else. Right, right, a uh -huh. modem. Yep. No modem sound. And so I, I really enjoyed the connectivity. So for me, it was, it was always a little bit about people and a little bit about tech. And the, th the thing that the internet did for me was that it was both. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that always fascinated me. The fact that just, you know, a few, many pages, of lines of code could create this experience where I'm chatting with someone somewhere else, you know, and, and now we're playing games on our phones and on our computers with someone far, far away. Uh, but back in the day, it was, it was pretty wild to think you're talking to someone um, and communicating and connecting. So I, I very much like a, like a technical communicator or connector, just really loving people and tech at the same time. And creative. I mean, a magician. I love yeah. that. I think there's a, there's a fun presentation side and that gives me some, some insight into where you all are today. But you also spent some time in the marketing automation front, if, if I'm correct. So tell yeah. me a little bit about that experience maybe where you see that going today. And then uh, I'm going to have you think back a little bit after that, but I'd be curious where your take is on marketing automation right now. Totally. My biggest challenge in marketing as a, as a wee young marketing lad was <laughs> what am I doing making a difference? Like, am I actually affecting things? A lot of times I would, would be in a company where they were practicing activity marketing. Maybe if we yeah. do more, people will think, we're doing more, right? Like more activities. And, and it wasn't until later when I was able to be more strategic and learn and realize you need to be all about ROI. And then it, it was a game changer. But early on, I was just doing activities for my marketing teams. And I remember getting people on a webinar and then wondering, you know, 
what did that do? <laughs> like, do I, am I actually making a difference in this company? And I, and I had to wonder now, if I'm wondering that, I'm sure the executive management is wondering, what is marketing doing too? So I, I, I grew up in, in a world where you tried to hack Google Analytics to maybe show you that in the B2B world, but never really perfectly. So for me, the big aha was when marketing automation proper started popping up. And yeah. for me, the tool was Pardot, which uh, has gotten purchased by Salesforce. Um, and I used that tool and it was so intuitive. Yeah. And this, the salesperson that quote sold it to me was so cool and fun and a real person. And everyone else was explaining all these crazy things. Um, I even talked to Eloqua and I talked to all these, other, they all explained these crazy detailed explanations. And the Pardot sales rep, shout out to Adam said, capture, nurture, automate is what marketing it. automation is. And he uh -huh. simplified it and it started this wild adventure where I, I went, I basically became like a massive fan of this tool that, that helped me out in, in one company. I bring it to another company. And every time I went to a new job, I brought the tool in with me and loved it. And eventually people said, those are some really cool stories. Could you help me with that? And so I was blessed to have a whole agency uh, come about and run that for 10 years, just really cool. obsessing around capture, nurture, automate, and then adding reporting into that and ROI. Um, so it's just been an amazing journey. That's tremendous. And a big shout out to Adam. I, I got to say, look at that. Talk about making trust in a relationship that really went someplace. That's cool. To see. That's cool to hear. Yeah. We had a chance to work together too in the agency for a little bit, which was really fun. Awesome. I'd love to hear those stories. So take me back you know, just graduating college, if there's one piece of advice you'd have for yourself, what would it be? Yeah, I think a lot about this, uh, this particular question. And for me, it revolves around the fuzzies. And, and I think my phrase is follow the fuzzies. It, when you have a passion and excitement for something and it makes no logical sense, but you can't help but talk about it all the time to people. For me, it was Pardot and now it's podcasting. When you have one of those things, it, earlier it was it was plays and production. They all start with P's. You got to find your letter. <laughs> <laughs> um, follow that. Listen to it. Sense it. And your tastes change every seven years. They say, you know, maybe these passions do too. So it's okay for them to come and go. But I think my advice to younger Casey is, listen to that. I, I look back and I, I saw some notebooks from my, my college days and I found one for linear algebra. I don't know if you, did you ever take linear algebra? No, um, I communication side of the world, hundred percent. Yeah. You see, you, you were blessed. I was cursed with this class. Um, and, and I look back in this thin little notebook and I, the notes look like hieroglyphs. They're these like mm -hmm. crazy multiple dimensional matrices and all the, and symbols and create. And I was like, wow, I don't remember any of that right now, <laughs> right? As I'm looking through this notebook, but then I looked over and there was another notebook that was three, four times as thick as maybe an inch and a half um, binding notebook. I'm like, what is that? And I knew immediately that was a notebook where I ran the theater company for our college, right? Uh -huh. And so there was this one where I'm like grinding through math, clearly no fuzzies there, right? And there's this other one where I'm spending so much of my time enjoying not only theater, but running a theater company and yeah. getting our show off our you know lame stage here at the cafeteria and getting us into professional theater at the city, right? And, all the, awesome. and getting our ticket sales online for the first time ever, right? All these different things I was, I was innovating. I was being an entrepreneur um, and, and I didn't know any better. And also I just did it because it, I sort of had a passion for it. But at the same time, you'd always feel guilty because what's your grade in linear algebra, right? Um, yeah. But I think my advice to younger me is, you know, do the things you need to do, but also really be sensitive and be listening and, and listen to yourself for where those passions are and then just go for it because that's where that agency came from. That's where Ringmaster came from. That's where all these things came from was just me yeah. listening and maybe just placing a bet on myself when that passion was involved. I love it. I think that's a good lesson for anybody, especially right now. I mean, we see the amount of mix-ups at the start of this year and changes all across the economy. And so at, at any age, right? At tougher at different ages and different times in life, but what a good lesson to take away. So talking about passions, 
I know you have a passion for podcasting and for marketing, <laughs> for having these great conversations. What are you passionate about outside of this? Where are we going to find you on a weekend, uh, relaxing or enjoying your time off? Heck yeah. You're going to find me on a ski slope. I'm going to be wearing a red coat with a white cross on it, uh, doing my best to save lives and get people down off the mountain if they've hurt their knee or anything like that, or just helping people um, out of tricky, sticky situations. Um, I started volunteering for ski patrol and, you know, I'll, I'll sort of claim it now. I thought it'd be cool to wear a red coat and ski for free. Um, it so is it's a not cool like look. I had these like pure motives where, ah, helping people's fun, but man, have I been surprised, uh, that actually it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Um, in my entire life is just to help people out um, while skiing. So you get to ski, but then you also get to just be there. Um, and you're there for people when they're in a very bad spot. They're like, they're in their worst spot. And if you can just be there to give them a moment and let them know that you're going to get them down and, you know, they're going to get the attention they need. And, you know, I'm here for you, right? Just to be able to Making be there impact, for someone. Yeah. And also physically, right? I think sometimes yeah. when we're doing talking about soft skills and whatnot, when we're, we're so virtual, we forget that even just putting your hands on someone to reassure them on their shoulder because their knee is screaming out in pain. There's yep. something special about that in person. As much as we can go virtual, there's in person. And then also the reward back. It just, it's that much more tangible when you can help someone right in front of you. No, that's, that's amazing. I, so what ski resort can we find you on? Number one, I got to blow your cover. Sure. Crotchet Mountain over here in okay. the East Coast, part of Vail Resorts. Really cool. Really cool mountain. Very I'm nice. really impressed by Vail, by the way. It's a whole nother side tangent. Um, but having yeah. run companies and been a part of companies, um, I've been really impressed with it, um, which is saying a lot. So that's I'm, I'm awesome happy. to hear. It's fun. That's awesome to hear. You, you've, you've sparked an interest in me because uh, as an avid skier here on the West Coast, I got to say, um, Vail runs most of our mountains out here too. But uh, what, a, what a cool thing to, to work towards. So Heck exciting. Yeah. We're going to get you out there. That. We're going to get you in the patrol. Hey, make it, making an impact. That is, that is awesome to hear. So Casey, before we wrap this up, I want to make sure everybody can connect with you. I want to make sure that we uh, can find your podcasts and, uh, and, and get in touch. So let me just go through where people can find you a little bit, um, social channels and some of those. What are some great places to connect? Sure. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Easy peasy. Casey Cheshire. Um, I'm also on Twitter, uh, TBD, if that, what, what that's going to be all about, but it's Casey Chesh on Twitter. <laughs> if you're, if you're on it, um, uh, email too, just direct right to me, Casey at ringmaster.com. Um, happy to connect. Awesome. And we will have all these in the show notes below. So make sure to uh, look up Casey, connect with him on LinkedIn and listen to his two podcasts. Um, Casey, great to have you on B2B EQ. Looking forward to uh, working on this together and learning a lot as we grow. Tim, you're a natural at this. You did a fantastic job. I really enjoyed this. I look at the, up at the clock and I can't believe the time has flown. So that is the mark of a, a true podcast host. So I, I see many, many episodes in your future. Hey, a lot of guidance from you and the team at Ringmaster. Um, Got to say, if you're looking for someone to help you get a podcast off the ground, this is the team to do it. And uh, until our next episode, Casey, thank you again. Uh, look forward to talking soon. Thanks, man. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.